will understand that a bit better when I go on to discuss the reciprocal lattice. But the way it's done is like this, that if I want to refer to this particular plane, then I find that it has an intercept of 1 along A1, it has an intercept of 1 along A2, and an intercept of a half along A3. I then take the inverse of these numbers, and I get 1, 1, and 2. Inverse means 1 divided by 1, 1 divided by 1, and 1 divided by a half. So I take the reciprocal of these numbers, and this gives me the indices of that plane. And we use round brackets to specify plane. So this is crystallographic convention, very well established crystallographic convention. When you use round brackets, that means planes. So, any idea what this plane is? 1, 1, 1, because it intercepts all axes at 1, and the reciprocal of 1 is just 1. So here, you intercept 1, 1, 1, and therefore the indices are 1, 1, 1. How about this one? Sorry? First of all, the, the intercepts are infinity. It never intersects A1. If I take this plane, it will only intersect A1 at infinity. Okay. It intercepts A2 at 1, and it never intercepts A3. So again, infinity. When I take the reciprocal of this, I get 1 over infinity is 0, 1 over 1 is 1, and infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. So this is the zero one zero plane. How about this one? Zero one one, because the intercepts are infinity with a one, one and one, and the reciprocal of that gives me zero one one. Now you'll understand why we take the reciprocal later on. But this is the way that we refer to the indices of planes. And just like we had crystallographically equivalent directions, we of course will also have crystallographically equivalent planes. In other words, you know, all the faces of a cube are exactly identical, really. And the indices that you use for each plane depend on the choice of coordinate system. So, for example, the 111 plane has the same arrangement of lattice points as 1 1 bar 1, bar 1 1 1, 1 bar 1 1, and so on. So, to indicate crystallographically equivalent set of planes, we use brackets like this. So, when, whenever I use braces, these are called braces, that means I'm referring to planes of that form. Can I index this plane? Now, that is the same as this plane. Yeah. So it intersects um, A1 at infinity, it intersects A2 at 1, and A3 at infinity. So it's the 0, 1, 0 plane. The same is due to mathematic or the atom, we should call atom, atom, 
mean, yeah, this, this plane here is exactly parallel to this plane and has exactly the same arrangement of lattice points. So all I've done is I've shifted the origin of the unit cell to another lattice point in order to in identify that plane. Okay, um, this is uh, stating the obvious, that when we talk about a vector, it has a magnitude and a direction. I'm just going to go through some elementary operations with vectors. So a vector is a quantity which has a magnitude and a direction, and it's a physical quantity whose magnitude doesn't vary with your choice of coordinate system. And if I take a dot product between two vectors, then that is the same as saying the magnitude of A1 times the magnitude of A2 multiplied by the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And this is no longer a vector. Uh, it's a scalar quantity. So sometimes this is known as a scalar product. And you can think of it like this, that this represents the projection of A2 along that direction. Now, a cross product is a vector product. So, A1 cross A2 gives you another vector which is at 90 degrees to both of them. So, the vector A3 is at 90 degrees to both A1 and A2. And the magnitude is A1 times A2 times sine of the angle between the two vectors. This symbol here simply means that this is a unit vector. It has a magnitude of 1. And the magnitude of the whole vector will be given by this multiplied by A3. Now what is the physical meaning of this cross product? Well, it represents the magnitude A1, A2 sine theta gives you this area here. And this is at 90 degrees to that area. So A3 hat is normal to A1 and A2, and A1, A2 sine theta is simply the area of the plane which is formed by A1 and A2. If I now take a combination of a cross product and the dot product, then A1, A2, dot A3 gives me the volume of this unit cell. Because look, A1, A, A1 cross A2 is the area of the base, and there will be a vector, A1 cross A2 will give me a vector which is at 90 degrees to this plane. If I then take a dot product of A3 with that vector which is at 90 degrees to this, then it's telling me the height of that unit cell. So the area times the height will give me the volume of the cell. And it doesn't matter whether it's a cubic cell or a triclinic cell, this will give me the volume of the cell when I take A1 cross A2 dot A3. So just to summarize, this is the meaning of the dot product. And I can think of it uh, slightly differently, that if I have a vector u and I dot it with a unit vector v hat, then it simply gives me the projection of u along this direction, which is u cos theta. So this is again the cross product. If I take A2 cross A3, I get a vector which is at 90 degrees to that, uh, and whose magnitude is the area of this cell. And then I dot it with A1, and I get the height of the cell. So the base times the height gives me the volume of the cell. OK. I'm now going to describe the reciprocal lattice. 
And this is a concept which is difficult to absorb because we are going to think in dimensions of one divided by length. Now, why do we need to do this? Well, one of the reasons is that reciprocal lattices are very useful in diffraction theory. Uh, and the reciprocal lattice is defined as follows. You remember that this is simply the volume of the unit cell. Yeah? All these terms here are the volume of the unit cell. And this represents the area between A2 and A3. So these are the basis vectors of the unit cell. That means they define the unit cell. A1 star is obtained by taking A2 cross A3 and dividing by the volume. So it is a vector which is at 90 degrees to A2 and A3. And its magnitude is 1 upon the spacing of the plane defined by A2 and A3. So it points at 90 degrees to A2 and A3. And its magnitude is 1 divided by the spacing of the planes formed by A2 and A3. Similarly, A2 star points at 90 degrees to A3 and A1, and its magnitude is 1 divided by the spacing of the plane formed by these vectors. If I take these three vectors, that defines the reciprocal lattice unit cell. And we did the indices of the planes. We formed the indices by taking the intercept and the reciprocal of the intercept. So if I take the 211 plane, then that actually is the 211 vector in, in the reciprocal lattice. Yeah. So a vector in the reciprocal lattice has a magnitude which is 1 upon the spacing of that plane, and it points at 90 degrees to the plane. And that is the reason why the indexing for planes, we take the reciprocal of the index. So in a reciprocal lattice, a vector is at 90 degrees to a particular plane and its magnitude is 1 upon the spacing of those planes. So here is an illustration of how to construct the reciprocal lattice in two dimensions. So here we have the vector A1 and A2, so this is the unit cell in two dimensions the normal unit cell, A1 and A2. And A3 is pointing at 90 degrees outside of the screen. So in order to get A1 star, A1 star is equal to A2 cross A3 divided by the volume of the unit cell. Now remember that A3 is pointing out of the volume. So if I take a cross product of A1, uh, this is A1, and A3 going out of the board, then A1 star should be pointing along here. So this is wrong, okay? This should be A1 star, and this is A2 star. Similarly, if I take the cross product of A2 and A3, okay, then it will point along this direction. Now, notice that this vector is pointing at 90 degrees to this plane. Okay. And furthermore, its magnitude will be given by 1 divided by the spacing between these planes. And similarly, this vector is pointing at 90 degrees to these planes, and its magnitude will be 1 divided by the spacing of those planes. And that is the reason why this vector is larger than this vector, because the spacing here is smaller than the spacing here. So the size of the vector is related to 1 upon the spacing of those planes. Everyone happy with that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, actually, some books they uh, define the reciprocal lattice 
computer, they multiply this to 2p. 2π. No, they multiply the... Uh, can you use the previous slide? Yeah. Where you, when you define... Yes, this one. Mm. The uh, reciprocal vector, they... Uh, this equation, but they multiply also with the 2p. Two what? Two P. Five. Yeah, yeah. Five. Yeah. Five. Yeah. So I mentioned to you earlier that um, reciprocal lattices are very important in diffraction theory. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and in waves, sometimes you get this two pi. Yeah. Because the total angle for one wavelength is two pi. So you can define the reciprocal lattice in such a way that the 2 pi disappears out of the equations when you're doing diffraction theory. So it's just another way of defining the reciprocal lattice, which is convenient in diffraction theory. But the normal crystallographic way is not to use the 2 pi. Uh, yes, so that, uh, in my opinion, the PC uh, problem is coming from the uh, experimental problem, right? Yes. Why do they find the, uh, the uh, diffraction law is it not uh, exactly depend on the uh, real lattice, but it belongs to the uh, reciprocal yeah, lattice. Exactly. So please for that. Yeah, you're right. But then, you see, you also have to refer to planes. So you need the indices of the planes. And if you had the 2 pi, then the indices would look strange. Yeah? So, so when we refer to a particular plane, we would have to have that factor 2 pi in there. So, you are right. I mean, in diffraction theory, you define it with that factor 2 pi. But when we refer to planes, you definitely don't have the 2 pi in it. <coughs> because we are dealing with the vector. Yeah. We, we are dealing with the vector. Uh, yes, I am mean the vector, but uh, when we find vector, we need the direction and the magnitude too, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I reckon we need to two uh, also the magnitude and also the direction. Okay, it's okay. So yeah, you, it's two ways of defining the reciprocal lattice. One is convenient in diffraction theory, but the other one you use for referring to planes. So a reciprocal lattice vector is normal to a plane and has a magnitude 1 upon d where D is the spacing of those planes. So we've finished a major part of crystallography. Yeah, we've defined the unit cell, we know how to refer to directions, and we know how to refer to planes. And we've covered the concept of reciprocal lattice. And the reciprocal lattice uh, you know, becomes a very easy concept once you start to use it. So far, we've only defined things. But we haven't talked about crystals yet. This is just imagination. Lattice points don't exist. They are simply imaginary points in space. Now, this is a lattice. It is an imaginary construction. And I want to convert that into a crystal structure. So what I do is I place a set of atoms at each lattice point. Okay, now, in this case, I'm placing a copper and a zinc atom right, at each corner of a primitive cubic cell. So this is a primitive cubic cell. And I'm placing one copper atom and one zinc atom at each of those points. So there's the first set. There's another set, another, and another. Now, if you just look at this part, what is the crystal structure? Can anybody tell me? Hmm? Cubic P. Cubic P. Yeah, very good. Because this is not a lattice point. Yes? This is a different atom from this. It doesn't have the same environment as this. So this is primitive cubic with a motif. We call this a motif of one copper atom at a half, half, half and one zinc atom at zero, zero, zero. So this is the structure of brass, copper zinc. With 
a motif of a copper atom and a half a a and a zinc atom at zero zero zero. It can be the other way around as well. It can be zinc at half 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 and copper at zero zero zero. But by placing this group of atoms at each lattice point, I've generated the crystal structure of brass. So lattice plus motif equals crystal structure. So it would be wrong to call this body center cubic. And indeed, if you do a diffraction experiment, this will have the lines corresponding to a primitive cube, not to a body center. And in three dimensions, the structure looks like this. That we have a, a copper atom at each corner and a zinc atom at the body center. So, to generate the crystal structure, we take our lattice and we put a motif on each lattice point. And that is the reason why when we have wallpaper designs, we have many, many more wallpaper designs than five possible arrangement of points because we can place different motifs at the lattice point. We can put a flower, we can put several flowers at each lattice point, we can put a bee at each lattice point, and so on. So we can generate many, many more patterns than just five sets of points. But if you look at the regularity of points, there are only five possible points. So it's primitive cubic with that as our motif. Okay, and now this is the face centered cubic lattice, where we have face centering lattice points here, here, and here, and the corner lattice points at 0 and 1. And I'm going to generate the diamond crystal structure. So I'm going to place a carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and another carbon atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter for every single lattice point. So here's the first set carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and a carbon atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. And I've got to do that for all the lattice points. So there's another one at a... That lattice point was at a height half, so this one will be at a height three quarters. Yeah, everybody happy with that? Yeah, because the original lattice point here is already at a height half. So this one becomes at a height three quarters. And so on. So I do that. And this is the crystal structure of diamond. Very, very simple. But if I showed you a photograph of this structure, it would look incredibly complicated. Yeah? I mean, how would you describe that to a friend? On the other hand, if I went back to this, okay, and I removed all the removed all the atoms. I started with the face and the cubic cell and I placed a motif. It's very, very easy to generate that crystal structure. So I think when you get to real materials, forget about drawing a three-dimensional structure. Just draw the projection, start with the lattice and place the motif. Now, instead of having the same atom, carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and another carbon atom at a quarter, 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 if I place a zinc atom at 0, 0, 0, and a sulfur atom at a quarter, 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 then I generate the zinc sulfide crystal structure. So this is like the diamond structure, but now I place a motif which, is, which has two different atoms the zinc atom at 0, 0, 0, and a sulfur atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. But otherwise, it's like the diamond structure. And that's what the structure looks like in three dimensions. If I make all those atoms identical, then it's exactly the same as the diamond crystal structure. So this is the zinc sulfide crystal structure. Now, this is 
exactly like the zinc sulfide crystal structure, we have round gallium atoms and square nitrogen atoms. This is a very important compound, this gallium nitride. And we, when we add indium as well to it, it's gallium indium nitride. And there was a Japanese scientist who discovered that by changing the gallium and indium ratios, you can alter the band gap. And then you can make light emitting diodes with different colors. So I don't know if you ride bicycles, but the lights of bicycles are now made from gallium indium nitride. And it's extremely bright and uses very little energy. So the batteries last for a long time. And the bulbs also last for a long time. And yesterday we were driving around, uh, I think Taipei or maybe here. Yeah. Yeah. And the so traffic lights are now made out of gallium indium nitride. So previously you used to have to replace the bulbs every six months. Now it's a lot longer before you have to replace them and they use ten times less electricity. It's a very, very major innovation to produce colored light emitting diodes. So you can get blue, you can get red, green. People are working on white. Okay. Now you can generate white by combining uh, the different colors, but unfortunately, the different colors age at different rates. So it, the white begins to become colored after a while. So there's research going on to make white, and then we can replace the lights in housing by light emitting diodes, white light emitting diodes. And that will save an enormous amount of electricity. So I'm not really worried about the CO2 reduction targets. We will work together, make better lights, make better efficient power generation, and reduce that. We just need money from the government to do the research, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is gallium nitride. Uh, the fluoride structure, calcium fluoride, CaF2, is again cubic air, but with uh, a motif of calcium atom at 000. zero, zero and two fluorine atoms, one at a quarter height and one at three